The following is an HDNet original presentation. Tonight, understanding an uprising. An American Muslim scholar with White House connections says Mubarak must go now. If he stays till September, he has the time to regroup and create whatever circumstances he needs to to maintain his grip on power. Also, targeting journalists. A regime seeks to silence the messenger. The actions of the government show that they wanted to remove witnesses. They wanted no one contradicting their narrative. And blood in the name of honor. Forced marriages, cultural clashes. Great Britain sees a spike in violence against women. From this day forward, you have two choices. Marry the man we've promised you to, or from this day forward, you are now dead in our eyes. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Reports. Good evening. Tonight, we will do something that we don't believe you've seen enough of on television news this past week. We will spend a good part of the next hour trying to explain the why behind the uprising in Cairo. Until recently, little thought was given to Egypt. As an ally of the United States, it is rarely mentioned in the ongoing conflicts in the Middle East. Most Americans probably know more about its famous pyramids than about its politics. But as the violence subsides, at least for the time being, and political negotiations move front and center, our goal here is to provide perspective, what we in television call a wide shot, to more clearly understand what provoked the passions on the Nile. <laughs> this is Tahrir Square, in the center of the Egyptian capital, Cairo, where hundreds of thousands of protesters gathered last week. Our reporter-producer, Willem Marx, has been in the square with his camera this past week, and these are some of the first high-definition television pictures of the protest. <laughs> to grasp the extraordinary nature of these rallies, you need to know this. Egyptians have no legal right to public assembly. It was only the massive numbers that emboldened people enough to come out and openly criticize their own government. I am here with my people. I am here to support them against the most criminal government in the world. Dr. Morsi Mansour is Egyptian and works in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But his heart and home have always been in Egypt, where he was recently working on a health care project. But he stayed here, he says, to support his countrymen against President Mubarak and his allies. They destroyed the spirit of the Egyptian people for 30 years. They make the people afraid, coward. Most of the people lost their reality, their identity. They want to leave Egypt and not return back. These young people brought this spirit back and most of the Egyptians want to return back their country. No one knows exactly why the protest started at this particular time. The Egyptian government certainly didn't see it coming when it did, and neither did the West. The storm from below among repressed masses has been boiling in Egypt for a long time. To comprehend this rage, you first need to know something about this country. With its 80 million inhabitants, the median age here is very young. 24 years old. Official unemployment matches that of the United States, just under 10%. But 90% of the unemployed are under 30, and having a college degree means you're actually less likely to find work. Educated people got nothing, got nothing. I have three kids. They are uh, out of the, they complete their university, but I'm very worried about their jobs. They don't have jobs, I know that. And they look on the streets and find some young other people 
they have they are very very rich opportunities to succeed to break out of the working class and join the elite are very rare and combined with a heavy-handed government that is considered dictatorial and highly corrupt it becomes clearer why so many people were rallying in the square this was a protest movement driven by word of mouth and long simmering anger at the president's extraordinarily wealthy inner circle recent estimates put mubarak's personal fortune in the tens of billions of dollars while the average salary in egypt is less than six thousand dollars a year they created corruption as a culture in egypt it became a culture not only in their party they even inserted it and implanted it in every organization in egypt in, in universities the leaders are corrupt in schools in everywhere but those who benefited most from this system had begun to fight back against the protesters. And so Dr. Mansour was one of dozens of doctors voluntarily treating protesters injured in clashes with Mubarak supporters. To understand the violence that caused these injuries, it's necessary to see how and why the situation in Tahrir Square deteriorated so rapidly. It had started out cheerfully enough. Many protesters filmed events on camera phones, barely believing the scenes they were witnessing in what is normally a tightly controlled police state. If the protesters seem animated, anxious to tell their stories, we hit him. you should know that many ordinary Egyptians were speaking their minds openly for the first time in their lives. Quite a few seemed eager to start their own chants against Mubarak. And repeatedly, protesters would address our camera. Mubarak, go! Mubarak, go! Hosni Mubarak is only the fourth president in Egypt's 58-year history as a modern nation-state and by far the longest serving. The former Air Force officer has ruled Egypt for more than 30 years aided and abetted mightily by American money that has totaled more than $60 billion since he took power. Most of the money goes to Egypt's military, and it helped buy these tanks parked on Cairo's streets. People in the square were protesting Mubarak's rule. Those outside were supporting his decision to stay in power. They were kept apart by this barrier, initially a peaceful dividing line. But during the course of the week, the debate descended into chaos. The Egyptian army had been keeping the protest peaceful, but when the army withdrew, all hell broke loose. Egyptian government officials listed around 5,000 injured and acknowledged 11 deaths. But the United Nations estimated that the number of Egyptians killed is closer to 300. Kill the world that Mubarak is a criminal, is a murderer, is a robber. We hate him and his gang. Till Obama, till all the president in the world. That Mubarak is a, a very, very criminal. Tell them. Protesters would occasionally identify someone they suspected of spying for Mubarak's feared secret police. Retribution was swift and oft times brutal. The clashes in Cairo. Now, just ahead on our program, an Egyptian scholar who has been called to testify before the U.S. Congress, and she's just returned from the region. You will hear her thoughts in a moment. Welcome back. Joining us now, Dahlia Mogaid. She was born in Egypt, but grew up in the United States and now has become a respected voice on Middle Eastern affairs as the executive director of the Gallup Center for Muslim Studies. 
and she's been appointed by President Obama as an advisor to the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Welcome. You're just back from the region. Mm -hmm. Assess for us now, if you will, as best you can, what has happened, what is happening in Egypt. What I'm seeing today in Cairo and in Alexandria and other parts of Egypt is something I didn't think I'd ever see. It's not just a secular demand for democracy, but it's also certainly not a religious revolution. It is a, it is a struggle for civil rights, for economic opportunity, for equality, and for some people that is animated by their faith. But there are certainly secular people in the movement. There are very religious people. There are Muslims. There are Christians. This movement is inspired by a newfound sense of self-worth, a sense that Egyptians want to live a life of dignity no matter what their background is. We found something very interesting at Gallup. Egyptians' sense of well-being, their life satisfaction, and their optimism has actually been steadily decreasing, decreasing. Over, decreasing over the past 10 years as their GDP, as their economic development is actually increasing, which is really very strange because we find uh, a, a very strong correlation between this, this sense of um, life satisfaction and GDP. They should move together, but in, in Egypt, they were actually going in completely different uh, directions. And when you look at what drives well-being, what drives life satisfaction in Egypt, the number one most meaningful variable is a sense of freedom. And so what we find in Egypt is that people's sense of lack of freedom was was hurting, was, was diminishing from their sense of life satisfaction and hope. And at one point, it, it just it, it hit a, a critical mass. Any idea what made it tip that critical mass? You know, a lot of Egyptians will tell you that the government is, is corrupt and oppressive, but they used to just talk about it like they would the hot weather in the summer in Egypt. It was just something that was a... a a nuisance, but you complained about it in a very inevitable way. But when I think when people saw Tunisia, they realized that it wasn't just like the hot weather in the summer, that it was something that people could change. What about this theory that already started in Tunisia, it's going to Egypt, and next we will see Jordan, Yemen, perhaps the West Bank go in similar directions. Do you subscribe to that theory? It's very hard to make predictions, and, and the last thing I'd want to do as a scientist is, is make a prediction I can't, uh, I can't justify. What I do know is that from what we've seen in Tunisia and in Egypt, leaders in the region and around the world can no longer simply rule countries just through force and just through fear. It just doesn't work. People now, I think by watching what's happening, in Egypt and in Tunisia have lost their fear, have realized, have rediscovered uh, a sense of self-worth that can't be controlled through fear anymore. They will have to listen intently to the needs of their people and make real reforms. If President Obama were in this chair and he said, I only have a few moments, tell me the one thing that I should do and what would be your suggestion? I would say that he should stand firmly with the aspirations of the Egyptian people and that our national security and our long-term interests lie firmly with democracy, not with the false assurances of a dictator. And if you took a moment more and the president or someone had said, well, it may or may not be good for our security, perhaps that's hanging in the balance, but this is terrible news for Israel mm. because Mubarak has kept peace treaties with Israel for all this time and that the peace treaty with the Israelis, quote, is not all that popular with the Egyptian masses. Your reaction to that? My reaction is that the Egyptian masses are concerned about 
domestic, political, and economic development. They want jobs. They want better education for their kids. They want to build Egypt back up to the proud country that they have, uh, they have read about, not seen. And those take valuable resources. Those take investing in their country. The last thing the Egyptian people want, if you look at all the protesters and all the things that they've written, is to waste precious little resources on starting wars with neighbors, especially very powerful neighbors. I think that if we were to truly have a representative uh, government in Egypt, a government that reflected the priorities of the Egyptian people, that it, the last thing they would want to do was to not fulfill their international obligations. What's the standing of the United States inside Egypt today, would you judge? What we do know is that historically, Egyptians have mostly felt that we don't act in according to our values. They admire our values of democracy and human rights, but they have repeatedly told us that we don't act out those values in our treatment of them. So most do not believe that we, we support democratic systems of government in their region. And why th this is so important to us is that we found a very a positive correlation between rejection of terrorism and the belief that the U.S. supports democracy. So supporting democracy in so many ways helps secure our own national security, and I would argue as well as Israel's. We stand for democratic process. We stand for freedom, individual freedom, and national freedom. These values are deeply ingrained in us. Mm -hmm. However, we also want to survive, sure. and particularly given post 9-11. Can it be reconciled, our wanting to stand firm for our values? On the other hand, we must take into account our security, because correct me if I'm wrong, this is part of how we got to Hosni Mubarak. Well, it's interesting you say that, Dan, because I would go back to what the president said in his inaugural speech. And he actually said he rejects us false, the choice between our security and our values. And I would agree with that. I think that they are one and the same. And here's why. If you look at bin Laden and his narrative, something very interesting emerges. He is making the case for why violence is the only way to justice. So what's interesting is how Al-Qaeda actually started was in an effort to topple the Egyptian government and the Saudi government. That was actually their, their beginning. And we became a target as friends of their enemies. We weren't actually the original target of Al-Qaeda if, if we go back to their history. What would happen to his legitimacy? What would happen to his relevance? And what would happen to his narrative if a group of young people peacefully demonstrating could make the change that all his bombs failed to do? What, what kind of a blow would that be to his ability to recruit, to his ability to make a case for himself? So I believe very clearly from that analysis that our security and our values are one and the same. They are not, uh, they are not a choice at all. Now I'll pretend that President Mubarak is in this chair. President Mubarak has said very recently, he, quote, reminded the Egyptian people that there's a very thin and dangerous line between democracy and chaos and anarchy. Mm. What would you say to him? I would tell him that if he loves Egypt, that he should step down. And I would say that the Egyptian people have demonstrated their capacity to live under a democracy. If you look at the way they've reacted to having no security whatsoever, rather than panicking and fighting one another, or instead calling for the dictatorship to come back, they actually created their own police force. They actually created community policing units in a very organized way, in a very civilized way. The protesters, the way that they have 
behaved with one another, the peacefulness of two million people, two million people in one place, and yet there aren't scuffles or fights or harassment or, or tension between Muslims and Christians. I think the Egyptian people have demonstrated to their own government, to themselves, and to the world that they are ready to govern themselves. And the chaos is created by repression, not by democracy. Do we know anything about American public opinion since these events have started happening in Egypt? Well, my colleague Frank Newport just sent me uh, our numbers actually on American public opinion in regards to these protests. And what he said is that 82% of Americans sympathize with these protests. And I, I actually think that that's remarkable because to get 82% of Americans to actually agree on anything is pretty remarkable. And this is across party lines. The majority of Republicans as well as Democrats actually say that they sympathize with the protesters. At this moment, and things change moment to moment in Egypt, Absolutely. but at this moment, what is the one thing you think Americans need to know more than any other about what's happening in Egypt? I think what they need to know is that the people not protesting, the people in their homes, are concerned. They want life to go back to normal. They want to go back to school. They want to go back to uh, work. But the only way that that will happen, the only way that some semblance of normalcy will return to Egypt is if President Mubarak steps down. Time frame? Does he have to step down quickly? The problem is that until he steps down, the protesters won't go home. Until the protesters go home, there will be this state of uh, insecurity in Egypt. What the protesters are concerned about is that all the progress they've made and all the work and all the sacrifice that they have put forth will, will all be gone if they, if they simply just leave the status quo as it is and, and be grateful for the bones that they've been thrown. Um, it's very important to understand the risks of Mubarak staying on. I mean, he says that he had never intended to run. I think everyone heard that as he wasn't going to run. But that's not what he said. He said he had never intended to run. He said that for the past 20 years. It always becomes a, a patriotic duty to run because the people need him. There's always a, 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 an, a, an emergency and a need for him to run. When he talked to Christiane Amanpour, he told her that he was fed up and tired of being in power, but that he couldn't leave because without him, Egypt would be in crisis. So he admit right there, his vision and his perception of his own people is that they need an iron fist, that they can't be ruled any other way. I think, Dan, that there's a real risk to President Mubarak staying on, even in a symbolic way, until September. What we found right after the elections that were widely seen as rigged in November and December is that immediately after the elections, the government uncovered a huge spy ring of Israeli spies operating in Egypt. You can actually track it after anything where the government is accused of doing something wrong and public opinion is starting to go against them. There's suddenly a national crisis that whips up populist sentiment and, and again, solidifies people's support for the government. My concern is what crisis will have to happen for Mubarak to actually stay longer. If he stays till September, he has the time to regroup and create whatever circumstances he needs to to maintain his grip on power. There is a real risk of what can happen and how much instability can be created in the country because there is at least a critical mass of people in Egypt that simply will not accept the status quo. And so there is going to be this huge tension between someone's grip on power and that won't let go and now a critical mass of Egyptians that won't accept it. Thank you very much. Thank you, very Thank you so much.
The protests in the Middle East have exposed, once again, something we've known for a long time. The world is no longer one of isolated cultures and nations. We are increasingly interconnected. British Prime Minister David Cameron recently ignited a firestorm of controversy when he said that his country has been too tolerant of multiculturalism. He argued that has allowed immigrants to maintain culturally segregated communities that can be breeding grounds for terrorism. The British Prime Minister's critics say he is feeding intolerance. But there are calls for change that are coming from inside Britain's immigrant communities themselves, particularly from women. Tonight, you will hear several heartbreaking stories we uncovered during an investigation into the practice of forced marriage. It is a practice not limited to any one religion or nationality. But you will see how old notions of honor can lead to murder. This is the England of glossy travel books. The changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. The dreaming spires of Oxford. It's the England of Jane Austen novels and costume dramas. But there are working class cities like Blackburn that have never been on tourist itineraries. These were the old factory and mining towns that once made England the leading industrial nation in the world and helped fuel a global empire. Those days are over. Cities and towns across England have undergone a radical change as immigrants from Britain's former colonies have flocked to the United Kingdom itself to live, work, and raise their families. Their children are often caught between the customs of the old country and the freedoms of modern Britain. My family came over from India to England in the 1960s, and basically they came over for work. Um, and sadly, they didn't leave their beliefs and values at Heathrow Airport. Bal Howard grew up in a tight-knit Sikh community in the north of England, surrounded by other families who had immigrated from India. But as she would find out, being born and bred in England didn't necessarily guarantee she'd have the same independence as other British women, especially when it came to marriage. I always believed I was going to have an arranged marriage, and always had the opportunity to say yes or no. Um, and then my family introduced me to the man who was going to be my future husband. But I thought I'd have a choice right up until the last minute. I met him for half an hour with the family around me, and they said I had to go through with it. But I didn't feel any physical chemistry or attraction or anything like that. And I said no, but my father said to me, if you think about running away, I'll find you, and I'd rather kill you and go to prison than you dishonor the family. It seems unbelievable that a father anywhere in the world would say something like that, but it's happening here in families that seem to be living modern lives in a modern nation. And it happens because some communities hold on to their ancient traditions in which women are viewed as property. It is based on an unwritten code of honor, as some call it. For a woman to disgrace her family simply by going against its wishes is the ultimate sin. For Baum, it was this culture of honor that convinced her she had no choice but to get married. And it was the same culture of honor that made her stay in the marriage, even when her husband turned abusive. What followed was eight and a half years of emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and I didn't want to be with him, but every time I went home to the family for help, they'd said to me to go back to him and make it work forever, ever, because it was your duty as a daughter to make it work, marriage is for life kind of thing. The violence Bal experienced was only made worse because, she says, her parents were colluding in the crime, forcing her back into an abusive relationship. This pressure from families can be so intense that some in Bal's position ultimately end their own lives. In fact, a 2008 study found that young South Asian women in the UK were almost three times more likely to commit suicide than their white counterparts. I thought, I don't want to kill myself because that thought had often gone through my mind. I said, I actually want to live 
and I've got to get out of here and nobody's going to help me, so I'm on my own. Morning. Would it be possible to book a taxi? Bal is now happily remarried with a new life, but she says once you decide to flee, you become an outcast from your own community, and the persecution often doesn't stop there. As we reported this story across Great Britain, we found other women from immigrant communities who had fled their families, but still lived in terror. This woman, whom we'll call Maya, is living with her two sons in a government-funded shelter under a new identity. The marriage that my parents forced me into was a sham. I had to force myself to do a lot of things in the marriage that I'd never ever do. She says she was repeatedly raped and beaten by the Indian man her parents made her marry. But when she fled, she soon realized it wasn't just her husband who was coming after her. I was receiving a lot of calls from both sides of the family, you know, um, a lot of calls asking me to go back, a lot of calls bribing me to go back, a lot of emotional blackmail, but I had to stand my ground. Oftentimes, that's not so easy. British law enforcement told us there are networks of informants across the country, and South Asian strangers in a new city will rarely pass unnoticed. Taxi drivers, moonlighting as bounty hunters, are sometimes used by families to hunt down runaway women like Maya. Maya's ex-husband has already tracked her down four times. Each time, Maya kept moving. A new city, a new name. We agreed to protect her identity and to avoid disclosing her current location out of concern for her safety. My biggest worries are of being found out, um, probably of the boys being taken away from me. Um, but having settled down here in this beautiful place, um, I'm beginning to see a hope for myself in the future. There is evidence to suggest that cases like Maya's are hardly rare and that the problem is not limited to a particular religion or country of origin. From London's Indian Sikh neighborhood of Southall to the large Pakistani Muslim community in the small northern city of Blackburn, old cultural practices do not seem to be fading, even within families who have been in England for generations. A government commission study in 2008 was used by politicians to suggest that there could be as many as 4,000 forced marriages in Britain each year. There is something fundamentally wrong here in Britain where in 21st century Britain we are still dealing with a, the barbaric practice of forced marriage. These are British born subjects. I thought Britain stood for democracy, independence and all those things. You know, we're not talking about some third world country out there. This is England. Jasbender Sangara runs a charity call centre that offers advice on avoiding forced marriages or escaping abusive family relationships. The mostly volunteer team here at Karma Nirvana fielded more than 4,800 calls in 2010. The callers here are often young and desperate women. Most are British citizens. The collection of clippings Jasbender displays here is a constant reminder of the real danger of forced marriage faced by some children. Parents might even take them overseas to marry foreign men eager for British visas. In the callers' voices, Jasbender often hears a version of her own story. I myself am a survivor of a forced marriage. I was born here in England. I don't know any other country bar England. This is home. I've never been to India. That's an alien country to me. I'm a British-born subject. I went to school here. But when I was at school here in the UK, I watched the majority of my sisters being taken out of British schools and when they were 15 years old to marry strangers they had only ever met in photographs. They would disappear to the Punjab of India, come back as somebody's wife and daughter-in-law and nobody in school blinked an eyelid and nobody asked any questions about their absence. When it was my turn, I was 14 and my mother presented me with a photograph of the man she told me I was promised to when I was eight years old and this is the first I'd heard of it. But I also knew it was highly probable because I'd watched it happen to my sisters. I said no, I said no, I I'm not marrying this man mum, I want to go to school, I want to get an education, 
and dare I say even go to college or university. My family took me out of school when I was 15 years old and I remember as clear as day my father walking me up to my bedroom, putting a lock on the door and being held a prisoner in that room for weeks on end and not being allowed to leave the room until I agreed to the marriage. Eventually Jasminder consented to the marriage, but as soon as she was let out of her room, she fled. When she called her mother pleading to return, the response was devastating. She said, from this day forward, you have two choices. You either come home and marry the man we've promised you to because you will not dishonor this family, or from this day forward, you are now dead in our eyes. And that's a picture of me when I was, um, how old was I there? Nine. Nine years old. And I'd already been promised to somebody in marriage in that picture. And that's my younger sister, who's a year and a half younger than me, and she was forced to marry the man that I was promised to. That was the only way my family, family could claim some of the honour back. The ultimate tragedy that led Jasminder to begin speaking out as an author and activist was the 1993 suicide of another of her sisters, Rabina. She suffered horrific violence in her marriage, went to my family for support, and they sent her back to the perpetrator saying it was her duty to make this marriage work for the sake of the family's honor. And in the end, my sister Rabina was 24 years old, and she set herself on fire, and she died of over 98% 90, burns, and she just died. For whose honor? Today, Jess Vendor has a packed schedule of lectures and media interviews, trying to inform the British public of a problem she says is still too hidden. That, that I came out of hiding. I was in hiding for almost nine years of my life. And I went back to my hometown and established the charity Carmen Agon. She's helped many victims of honor violence. They may be the lucky ones. As Detective Neil Hunter knows all too well, for some women, violence in the name of honor can end in murder. The circumstances around the level of violence and the frenzied natures of some of the uh, attacks is really quite upsetting. Detective Superintendent Hunter took us on a tour of murder sites in the northern English county of Lancashire. The relatively quiet communities here have witnessed roughly a dozen honor-related killings in the last six years. Hunter has been a detective here for decades, but hasn't seen anything like these crimes before. He left to get and arm himself with two knives that he put down the waistband of his trousers, walked up the road here, brutally murdered his estranged wife, and then he disappeared um, via the train station to London and then eventually to Glasgow. First stop was the house of Nazia Ahmed, whose estranged husband, Zamir, stabbed her to death when her success made him jealous. Zamir Ahmed refused to accept that his estranged wife wanted her own independent life and took the law into his own hands. Just a few miles away, Hunter pointed out the house where a husband burned his own wife and four young daughters to death because they'd become too westernized. There was five bodies on the floor, on the road, in the street, covered with tarpaulin, with the most horrific burn and smoke injuries that you could ever imagine. Then there was this neighborhood. They got out of the vehicle with a petrol can, walked round the corner. Hunter told us how hitmen from London firebombed a house and killed a husband and wife. Tense that it melted the glass in the vestibule door, and so the prospects of the people inside surviving were vi virtually zero. In this case, the victims weren't even the intended targets. The murderers had gotten the house number wrong. Roughly a quarter of all recent murders here in eastern Lancashire have been honor killings like these. But despite this shocking number, it has taken a while for UK authorities to understand what is happening in their immigrant communities. And some British law enforcement officials agree that understanding these killings, rapes, assaults, and kidnappings as unique forms of crime is essential to combating the problem. We are talking about thousands of women at risk in this country from people who claim to love them the most, their own families. Nazir Afsal, who was born into Britain's Pakistani community, is the director of the Government Prosecution Service and the point man on honor killings. 
The biggest obstacle I think we have faced uh, is the lack of awareness. Uh, people thinking that it wasn't happening. Uh, and that is allied with this wall of silence uh, within communities. Communities, particularly males in communities, don't talk about this issue. They would rather focus on anything else, quite frankly, than talk about the, what's happening to their own women and to their daughters and to their sisters. About seven years ago, I decided that this was an area that wasn't being talked about, that men certainly weren't talking about it. So I organized a national conference, which had lots of international coverage, and then realized that it needed a great deal more awareness. AFSOL initiated a review process that examined around 120 cases of disappearances and apparent suicides over the past decade. AFSOL subsequently reclassified a sixth of these as honor killings and saw recurrent themes in each. It's about the one woman being pressured by several members of her family, by dozens of members of her community, uh, and in worst cases, suffering significant harm. So this is not about honor. This is not about um, a faith or a ideology. This is all about women, women being controlled by men and men being so weak that the only way they can control them is by harming them. How many cases of forced marriage do you think happened in the UK last year? But British okay. authorities and independent campaigners like Jasvinder Sangara say a rise in general awareness may end up having the biggest impact. Nurses, teachers, police and other public sector workers are now being trained to recognize when a young woman could be a potential witness to an honor crime or may herself be at risk. And you are part of the solution for my part. At a college in the northern English city of Sheffield, we spent a morning in a training seminar where Jasvinder and a police officer were lecturing an audience of teachers. Some people think that this is an Asian problem and it's only Asian workers that should respond to it, and that's absolute rubbish. At the end of the day, if you have compassion, and we teach you today, you can respond as effectively as anybody else. It's about creating social responsibility. All right, OK. Have you got any questions for me or any concerns that you've got? There's a sense that Britain is waking up to the problem. Several police forces have officers like this one, dedicated to helping women from minority communities who are at risk. And in 2008, the British Parliament passed the Forced Marriage Act, which permits young people to take out injunctions against their own parents if they can prove they are at risk of being forced into a marriage. But Mal Howard, who herself left a forced marriage after years of abuse and now works with local police, says the key is getting the message of support to those young women fearing for their lives. I wanted somebody to help me, but I didn't know how to ask for help because I was taught from a family not to integrate with Western society. Don't tell them anything that goes on within these four walls. They won't understand. You're different from the other girls. You know, you're not an English girl. English girls are dirty. They, they, go, they have boyfriends. You're not allowed to have that kind of thing. So internally, I was screaming for help. And I think if somebody had said, come here, I can help you, I'd have sat down with somebody and voiced those inner concerns that I had. Many experts suggest that honor killings are not as big a problem in the United States because immigrants here are more assimilated than in Britain. But perhaps we're also not connecting the dots. Honor killings can happen here. An Iraqi immigrant in Arizona soon will go on trial for running over his own daughter because he allegedly felt she was becoming too westernized. We'll be back in a moment. And finally tonight, your right to know. Freedom of the press has long been one of our most sacred tenets, but that freedom often does not extend beyond our borders. Covering international stories, as the situation in Cairo has shown, can be challenging to say the least. And the immediacy of live television and the expansion of social networking can quickly present a picture to the world that a regime finds threatening. This was especially true in Cairo where supporters of the Mubarak government sought to intimidate journalists, often physically. Rob Mahoney is with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Rob, thank you for doing this. Appreciate you being here. You're welcome. You're here, among other things, representing the Committee to Protect Journalists, CPJ. 
For those who don't know, what is the Committee to Protect Journalists? Well, the Committee to Protect Journalists is a totally independent organization that was formed 30 years ago by American journalists who wanted to do something to help their colleagues around the world when they were attacked or harassed. And we use the tools of journalism, namely reporting on press freedom violations, to defend our colleagues around the world. As best you can tell, as best anyone can tell, what's the situation with the media and the Egypt story now? Things have eased up a little since last week when we, when we saw the, uh, the mobs running through the streets of Cairo assaulting journalists and we saw uh, the security services preventing journalists from working. But as of today, uh, journalists are still being stopped by security personnel and asked uh, for credentials and prevented from getting into Tahrir Square. Do we know how many journalists were detained in, and, and or thrown out of Egypt? At, at, uh, at the moment, the Committee to Protect Journalists has documented some 115 cases of people either being detained or having their equipment seized and, in some cases, attacked. We haven't seen numbers like that over a, a period of a few days ever in, in our history. I mean, journalists have had difficult assignments in the past, and they've had to deal with repressive uh, governments in the past. But the scale of this is, is quite unprecedented. Sketch for me what the press situation was in Egypt before the, the recent explosion. Before January the 25th, the situation was basically this. The government controlled broadcast media, particularly television. You then had on top of that Al Jazeera broadcasting via satellite, which a lot of Egyptians are able to watch. And then you have a smattering of independent newspapers, but not very many, and a very, very dull and boring official print media that nobody read except for diplomats and analysts <laughs> who wanted to try to read between the lines. Okay. Since then, uh, since January 25th, what we have seen is the broadcast media is still firmly in the grip of, of the administration, but a lot of the uh, print media ha are covering very well what's going on on the ground. Um, we've seen a couple of high-profile defections of journalists from state media Who's one of whom said, I've had enough, I, I can't be a hypocrite any longer. So we've had some resignations of, of, of uh, news media uh, talent. Uh, but on the whole, the situation has not changed fundamentally where it matters, which is on TV. Uh, where does Twitter, Facebook, the new availability of what we'll call social media, for lack of a better phrase, fit into this? What was interesting with Twitter and these other sites was that a lot of them were feeding information into traditional mainstream media. Particularly important in Egypt's case is Al Jazeera satellite uh, television in Arabic. They were able then to put this up onto a satellite and beam it back into Egypt in Arabic. So you had that kind of a triangle of uh, the information flow, right. and that's what the government wanted to break, and it did by trying to kick Al Jazeera off satellites that were broadcasting into Egypt, and in one case, we believe, even interfering with a signal. And when that didn't work fully, it shut down the Internet, which is a pretty drastic thing to do in order to prevent the news gathering. First of all, you ask, uh, you're very experienced. Compare what happened in Tiananmen Square and the movement for democracy and more openness in China, very complicated situation. But that happened 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. Compare that with what happened in Iran. I'm talking about the most recent difficulty in Iran uh, with what's happening in Egypt today. Well, in Tiananmen Square, it was much easier for the Chinese authorities to shut down uh, coverage of what was going on once they decided to turn their tanks and soldiers against their own people. So the technology enabled the, the message to get out of Egypt and not so out of, out, of, uh, out of Beijing. And in between that, you have Iran. And Iran was very interesting. You, a, a lot of the pictures that we saw out of uh, Tehran in uh, 2009 were taken on cell phones, were taken on small flip cameras. So what the, what the government did there is it didn't drastically react like uh, the Egyptians did by shutting down the entire internet. They just slowed it down so that you couldn't load heavy files, you couldn't upload pictures, you couldn't upload video. And the other thing that the Iranians did is that they turned the technology 
of the uh, the new social media against the people that were using it. You ar they arrested a few people. They said, give me your Facebook password. They tortured them to get the Facebook password. You then get into someone's Facebook account. You, you suddenly know all their friends. It's a secret policeman's dream because without having to do much at all, you suddenly got all these sources. So that's what the Iranians did. They turned Facebook against the people that were using it. Um, the Egyptians took a, a much blunter approach and just closed down the internet, closed down the cell phone network. Why should a regular viewer care about what happens to journalists in Egypt or how the press is or is not handled electronic and otherwise? Well, journalists are there to hold those in power accountable by reporting on what they do. Egypt is a key player in the Middle East. It's a key ally of the West. It's a key ally of Israel. We need to know that what the government in Egypt says it's doing, it is doing. The actions of the government in Egypt over the last few weeks show that they wanted to remove witnesses. They wanted no one uh, contradicting their narrative. Rob, thank you very much. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate you coming to do this. I appreciate you. Rob Mahoney with the Committee to Protect Journalists. And that's our program for tonight. From New York, for HDNet, Dan Rather reporting. Good night. If you would like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at viewer at hd.net.